All right, so this is CNET 121. We are forming a uh, cyber defense competition team. So you, have, you can go to my homepage and click this link and sign up if you wish to participate. This is um, the original collegiate competition. It's the oldest and the most respected uh, where you have a network containing many devices and you have to protect it against attackers and perform management tasks. And there's room for a lot of people on the team. We have six people so far and we could use more and we can use people at every level. Even people that are not very skilled yet can participate here. There are a lot of different tasks to be done. Um, so sign up there if you want to. We'll have our first event in early in December and the real competition comes uh, January or February of next year. There's a schedule here you can check out. And uh, there's scheduling issues for 121. Um, today is down here. Okay, today is November 5. Um, right, we'll have another a normal class next week, and then the week after that, class is canceled because of the collegiate penetration testing competition will be happening that weekend, and I'll be in Stanford with the team there. So uh, there'll be no Saturday class, and none the week after for Thanksgiving. So after that, just two more classes in December. So I've adjusted the due dates of a few things here. Um, so be aware of that. We'll class next week, but no class for the next two weeks. And uh, in your Canvas, there was a Module 10 that had a really long lecture, and I split that into Module 10 and Module 11 to fill up the remaining things. So our four students had already taken the quiz, so I did not split it into two quizzes. I just left it as one combined quiz, Module 10 and 11, uh, due on December 3rd. So um, it would be better to split it into two quizzes, but I don't want to do that this semester because some students have already taken it. So uh, that's it. That'll take us to the end of the class. And uh, let me take a look at the, today's module, which is going to be here in Canvas, and here, and I think it's Module 8 today, Module 9, all right, good. All right. Yeah, all right, so we're talking about cell phones, uh, the cellular network is a group of uh, cells. There's a mobile switching center that switches data packets from one group to another, from one network to another. And you may, if you call from one carrier, like from AT&T over to Sprint, then you'll have to go to the public switch telephone network, the old PSTN, to get there, um, which is kind of like the internet. You have a local network, you have your ISP, and then you have uh, branches between the ISPs uh, to go a large distance. So your mobile station is your phone, and your SIM card, which goes into your phone to give it a, to identify it. Then you connect to a base station subsystem, which is this little local antenna. You'll connect to it. And then you get to a base station controller. You get to the mobile switching center, where if you make a phone call or a mess, send an SMS message to someone on the same carrier, then this is as far as it goes. It will go to the carrier's switching center and then just move to the other customer. Otherwise, it'll have to go to the public network to get to the other carrier and then come back down. So the cell towers here have uh, these antennas. We've all seen them everywhere to receive it. They're controlled by the base station controller. And this handles the issue of handoffs. When you have your cell phone powered on, it makes a connection to the nearest tower. And it decides it probably will hear signals from several towers. And it picks a tower with the strongest signal and associates with it and tells that tower Here's where I am, so if somebody makes a phone call to me, send it to this tower that can reach my handset. And if you move with your handset, it will hold on to one tower and choose a time when it actually needs to be getting a stronger signal from another tower and then switch your hand off to the next one. So you can have a call in progress and it will hand off smoothly and not interrupt your call. This also means, of course, that the phone company has a record of where you are all the time. Unless you turn your phone completely off for example, remove the battery so that you could not receive an incoming phone call. It has to know where you are to deliver that incoming phone call. And this is where the privacy issue comes in. Um, there are records you can get from the phone company with this subpoena or court order um, that will record where everybody is. And these have been used for a lot of purposes. You can get, however, it's not incredibly accurate. Um, 
you'd be within something like 100 yards of the station. But if you get the signal from two or three stations and triangulate, you can narrow it down more. And I've seen maps, for example, they took this kind of data and they mapped all the people in the January 6th attack on the Capitol and mapped where all the people went from here to there. And anyway, so that's what's going on here. Um, so there's evidence on the tower and uh, you'll be able to get user information a lot of different ways. So here, you one thing you can get is what they call the pen register, where you just get a list of all the calls, who they called, and when they called, and how long the call was. And that's used for making your phone bill, um, but it's also very useful uh, for law enforcement. And this uh, is what Google stole from China in the famous hack of 2010. Now let's see, is there a record on your computer of which networks the computer connected to? Now that's an interesting question. Um, there certainly is a record of the names and the SSIDs of the networks you've connected to. And I know Apple devices, at least until a couple of years ago, Apple devices like iPhones had a serious privacy risk. iPhones, when they connect to a wireless network, I don't know, I think Apple might have changed this, but at least until a couple of years ago, they would have a rapid connection process, which did not go through the normal DHCP process. Instead, the first thing they would do is probe to see if you were connecting to one of the five networks you last connected to. <coughs> and if you were, it would just immediately connect with the old address, which made it faster. But this meant all you had to do is turn on Wireshark in a coffee house, and as soon as somebody booted up their phone, they would get the last five networks they connected to and you could find out where they are. So you could, for example, stalk somebody and find out where they live or where they work by just picking up the beacons sent out by their phone, the probe packets, when they boot up. As It was a privacy risk. And it became well known a few years ago, and I'm not sure if Apple fixed it or not. So that does imply that at least on Apple devices, there is some kind of cache that records your recent connections. Now, I don't think there's an extensive one going all the way back. Now, the phone company has all these records going back for a long time, probably months, maybe even longer. And it's a very good question. I don't know how far back that connection record goes. Um, I haven't seen it in any of the forensic analysis, but it's, it's a, an interesting question, and I don't know the answer. I do know car GPSs do have a record of everywhere you've gone, and you can get that out of them. But uh, I don't know if you get a long, real trace of all the wireless networks you've connected to. How to deal with things like pineapple Wi-Fi? Well, that's another issue. It's a very good question. The pineapple, the Wi-Fi pineapple spoofs networks, so it pretends to be networks it isn't. And that is an issue, of course. There's nothing about a Wi-Fi connection that is really unique. All you get is a the name of the network and the um, MAC address of the router. And both of those can be spoofed. So I could set up a fake network that your phone would connect to and think it's connecting to like a Starbucks when you're not at a Starbucks and there wouldn't be any actual proof of that. So uh, that would be, that's true out by the way of a lot of evidence though, like SMSs can be spoofed. So the fact that it can be spoofed doesn't mean it is useless in court, but it does mean that there will be some argument over whether it was spoofed. For example, one common thing you come across in court is they say, well, maybe there was a virus on my computer that put that evidence on there. And you can't say that's impossible. You could write a virus that would put evidence on there. You have to say, well, I didn't find any evidence of malware, and I've never seen that happen, that sort of thing. And so I regard that as unlikely, but it's not impossible. And so anyway, those are good questions. All right, so the mobile station is the handset and a subscriber identity module, the SIM card. And that's a little floppy disk looking thing, a little tiny thing uh, about a centimeter across that goes in your phone. And the main purpose of this is to uniquely identify the handset with this IMEI number. That is the unique identifier of the handset so they can tell which phone you are to direct calls to you. And so um, that has a first eight, six to eight digits sort of type allocation code and so on. There's details about how that number comes around, but that IMEI number is the thing that uniquely identifies you on the phone network. And that's why you can buy a new phone and just move your SIM card over and be the new one. And that's how um, SIM hijacking happens. So I forget the exact, people do this a lot, attackers do this. They will call the phone company and tell them I bought a new phone, move my IMEI to this phone, and then it can take over your phone that way. Um, SIM swapping, I think they call it and then they can get your SMS messages and break into your account. 
So uh, there's a smart card that identifies your subscriber. And there are more numbers here, like a mobile equipment identified number um, used on CDMA devices, which is um, one of the, I think that's 4G with CDMA. Um, I'm not quite sure. I had a CDMA phone for a while, and it rolled out and then went back. Anyway, um, phones are locked, typically. A typical phone you buy is cheap because it's locked to one provider, and you cannot move it to another provider. And uh, I believe the laws have changed about this. This is something Obama wanted a few years ago. Um, but originally, they would keep you locked to the provider, and you're locked in for the term of your contract. And so you would go to get your phone hacked to unlock it, and that was considered illegal, but I think now that is considered legal um, to move to a different carrier. And if you want to move internationally, again, you have to jailbreak your phone to do that. There's two separate issues. One is to unlock your phone so you can move it to a different carrier, which is a matter of somehow releasing it from being tied to one network like Sprint. And the other one is to jailbreak it so you can put unauthorized software on it. That's achieving root on it. You can buy used phones online that have been unlocked. Yes, you can. Yeah, and there are people that unlock them. There used to be a market of unlocking them illegally, and now I believe the law has changed, so now they are required to unlock it on request. Um, but I'm not quite sure on that, and it does change pretty often. So the SIM card is here, a blow-up of it. This is a flat connector that amounts to a, a serial connector when you plug it in. These little metal pads make a connection. and. Uh, there's other numbers on here, the IMSI number and the MCC country code and so on. Quite a few different numbers. All right, so once you connect, you are your mobile switching number has a database of subscribers, and that's the home location register. So you connect, it looks up your IMEI in the register to determine if you're actually a customer. It has a visitor location register, which is roaming subscribers that have turned on roaming and are using uh, another network temporarily. And you have an equipment identity register that determines whether your phone is valid or stolen. That identifies the equipment. All right, and there's an authentication center, which is what issues encryption keys for your connection, and all modern phone calls are encrypted. Uh, there, If you can downgrade someone to the really old network of 2G, then the encryption was really weak and can be broken, but everything that well, anybody is using you know, under normal circumstances in America, I think, is now 3G, 4G, or 5G, and they're all encrypted pretty strongly. Although, we talked about this before, the police or a hacker can put up a, um, a fake cell tower and hijack connections and downgrade your phone to something like 2G in order to break the encryption. And phones will do that because you might carry your phone to a remote location using old equipment. Your phones will downgrade to old protocols. The same thing is true of your computers. Your computers can negotiate down to old insecure protocols and it's a common attack to defeat encryption. Uh, it's a possible attack. It's probably not the most common attack, but it certainly is possible to have us uh, it's a commonly done with a man-in-the-middle attack. Intercept your traffic and change the traffic so you tell your server, oh, I'm a really old device, you have to speak a really old protocol that's not safe in order to get in. All right, so your mobile network operator runs this network like Verizon and T-Mobile. There are mobile virtual network operators, um, like I think Sonic is one of these, where they don't have their own physical wires, they're using someone else's physical wires and renting them as a provider. And that has gone back and forth many, many times over the decades. AT&T was once a monopoly in the whole nation, then they split it up, then they put it back together, then AT&T owned the wires, but they were forced legally to lease it to other carriers, and it goes back and forth. An endless battle. All right, so like I say, 2G up through 5G. 2G used time division multiple access to uh, combine different signals where each person would get a, a brief period of time, then another customer, then another customer, you get little time slices. Um, yeah, the new digital SIMs, yeah, I think the digital SIMs have the same security protocols on them, but I'm not really sure. Um, you're right, they, if you're, they're now digital SIMs, you replace these physical SIMs. All right. Anyway, um, code division multiple access is another way to do it, which is spread spectrum like Bluetooth, where it's using many frequency bands instead of time division slices to handle the different um, the different signals. 
And there was a news article that came out recently that there is a new kind of very high wavelength division multiplexing used to move an incredible amount of data through fiber optics. But that's not in common use yet. Anyway, um, IDEN was a Motorola text. That's another one that would let phones be used as walkie-talkies without the use of a cell tower. But I don't think you can do that with any common phone anymore. So the SIM card has an interface. And in there, it's got a PROM, which has um, a file system. And in there, there are um, various files in there. The master file, dedicated files, elementary files are the sections. And the part where subscriber information goes is the elementary files section. And that has contact names and numbers. Uh, it has the cell networks you have attempted to connect to connect to. So this will give a um, the forbidden public land mobile network. This will tell me where you, your phone has been. And it has the last number dialed, list of outgoing calls. And it has the area where the phone was last powered down and a list of SMSs. So there's a lot of information in there uh, tracking where you've been and what you've been doing. All right. And so they're pin protected. You have to guess the pin right within three times or else it gets locked. However, if you are a authorized forensic examiner, you can get an order um, from the carrier to give you a pin unlocking key that will let you in. So uh, that's only to prevent crooks from getting in. And you can clone SIMs if you have the unlocking key. All right, so you can find out whether messages were read, deleted, sent, unsent, and so on on a status flag. MMS messages are also on there. And uh, other things like rich communication services, WhatsApp and Signal, are also apparently uh, legally interceptable in here to some extent. There's been a lot of scandal over the last year about Signal. Signal made a big deal that they were point-to-point -point encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted, but the point is you can read it on your phone. So if you can do forensics on the phone, you can find your Signal messages, and people were upset about that. And Signal said, look, end-to-end -end encryption does not mean you can't read it on the phone, and a forensic examination of the phone will still reveal it. All it means is that you can't steal it off the wire while it's in transit. And I don't think anybody has suggested that that is possible. Uh, they've just confused people with this statement. All right. Anyway, then there's various mobile operating systems, and we'll talk about iOS in a later lecture. Here we're just going to talk about Android, and if you're taking the uh, mobile device hacking class, we're going quite deeply into hacking Android devices this semester. Um, so the boot partition on your Android device has the, the kernel and a RAM disk that's used to boot up the phone, and normally you just leave that alone and you get a standard operating system. You can, in principle, alter the boot and have a modified ROM and run a modified version of Android. That used to be very popular until about five years ago. Now it's pretty much fallen out of favor because the main reason people did it is because Android was very primitive and the unauthorized mods like Clockwork Mod had new interesting features, but Android improved, so there isn't much motivation to bother running an altered uh, partition these days. Most people don't do it. You have a system, it of course contains the system, there's a recovery image, so if something goes wrong, you can boot to a special mode and try to recover the operating system. There's a cache for temporary data and a MISC used by the recovery partition. And the most important one, data. Data is where all the installed apps are and where all the data for all the installed apps are, like your messages, your emails, your um, games you play, everything you put on the phone. Um, and all the data for all those apps are stored in these data folders. So that's where I spend all my time. That's where we pull down the APKs. You find the Smalley code that runs them, and you find all the stored data. And that's where I've, for the last many years, I've been going through here finding that an enormous number of apps, like about half the apps I test, store things here they shouldn't store, like your password, or with used either in plain text or stored with foolish kinds of encryption that are easy to reverse. So that's where all the um, personal data is. And then there's metadata used when the device is encrypted. These are all Dalvik virtual Dalvik files. Dalvik is the, um, it's called a Dalvik virtual machine, is the version of the Java virtual machine that runs on the Android phone. The apps are almost all written in Java and they run in this Java virtual machine called Dalvik. And the language is called Smalley which is bytecode which is very easy to read and modify. It's very close to just plain Java. And all right, 
So APKs are the files. Uh, all Android apps are a single APK file, which is just a zip container containing a bunch of files inside there, which it unzips and runs. And for some reason, every phone keeps a copy of the original APK and the unzipped APK for every app. Um, all right, then you've got uh, DHCP connections and Wi-Fi and so on, and uh, there's a system list of packages that are installed. Anyway, um, you'll find that in a data system packages.list and there are commands with USB debugging to just list all the packages on the phone. And you can pull the installed apps off the phone and analyze them with Android uh, debug tool. All right, so what normally what people do is they use commercial devices and just suck all the data off the phone with like a Celebrite UFED device. That's what most people do. Those things are expensive, but they just pay for it, and then you just plug in the phone and suck the data off it. Um, but there are other ways to do it. Now, phones are often have encrypted data, and if it's encrypted and you don't have the password or the PIN, then you're usually out of luck, although there are ways to do it. Um, in practice, there used to be ways to do it, like there, uh, there are some devices like gray keys that will break into some phones by just trying all the pins, but um, if you really want to get in to something like a locked iPhone, you're pretty much out of luck, and the only way to get in is to pay a lot of money. There are two companies that do this, Celebrite in Israel and Elcomsoft from Russia. I think they're from Russia, maybe they're from the UK. And these companies advertise that they have found defects in phone operating systems that they can use to break the encryption on every device with every version of the, of the operating system, and they will do it, but they charge a lot of money. And uh, what I hear is the FBI paid a million bucks to get into an iPhone with that. So um, it is possible, but it's expensive and difficult. And certainly it's beyond the reach of most examiners. What you have to do is outsource it to one of these big companies who will do it. Now, I think they don't charge a million bucks to do it for one phone. I think what the FBI did was pay a million bucks so they now own the tool so they can now hack into all the phones of that type they want. But um, I'm not sure how much of that information has been exactly publicly admitted. Um, they certainly did have to admit in court, though. They tried to go to court and force the Apple to give them, force Apple to give them a way to hack into phones. And at the court, they were forced to admit in court that in fact they had found another way to get in by purchasing from some vendor a hacking tool to get in. And therefore, it was not true that their only way in was to make Apple break their own product. And therefore, the court uh, stopped the lawsuit. And Apple was not compelled to make that product and it was never thoroughly tested in court whether the government has the power to force Apple to give government a backdoor into phones. There is a law called CALEA that forces American phone companies to give the government a way to tap telephone calls. So they are not allowed to say no, they must build into their network some kind of phone tap equipment and they must provide it to the government on request. And although law enforcement has tried for decades to get that for the internet, and for cell phones, they have not succeeded. They can tap the phone calls, but to get the data off the computer part of the phone, there is no legal requirement to provide that to law enforcement. And the um, Apple used to do it. You used to just send them a phone and a court order, and they would take the data off the phone and mail it back to you for a price of like 300 bucks. But they quit doing it a few years ago, and apparently they are not required to by law, although this hasn't been thoroughly tested. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, Glow, yeah, but Glow, Glow says a million bucks is chump change for a device that would let you break encryption on anything. Well, yes, but I imagine what they got would only work on certain versions of iOS. You know, because Apple is also constantly modifying their product to stop all this stuff, so you have to keep developing new attacks. But yeah, anyway, um, but I know I met, I met the, uh, one of the chief executive officers of, of Celebrite, uh, one of the, and I asked him this, and he then announced it on stage at I was and he did, they, in fact, I said, can you really break an encryption of anything? He said, well, we haven't admitted that publicly, but I think we will. And later that day, he did announce publicly, we can now break into every version of everything. <laughs> at least as of a couple of years ago, they were claiming that. But it's not cheap. However, they also said they're expanding their business. They originally would only do it for law enforcement agencies and governments, and they were expanding this service to offer it to companies. So, you know, your privacy on a phone is probably not very high, and you should be aware of that. And you see a lot of people, like, um, in all the investigations into Trump and the plans to subvert the election, 
a lot of SMS messages have appeared. Some from people have handed over some other ways. You know, amazing number of people make plots over SMS, private messages, and uh, email without apparently realizing that that stuff will just appear in court quite easily. <laughs> anyway, so be aware of that. Um, people do a lot of private things on phones, like a ton of people send private naked pictures on phones to their romantic partners, and then they're horrified when that stuff comes out. But if you're sending something over the phone network, you really shouldn't be trusting that to stay private. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so if you want to get the data off a phone, and you don't have like a Celebrite UFED device, there are other ways to do it. Um, one way is what we did in this course. I just made a logical acquisition. So I just run software on the device, just copy all the files in a folder. Now that's a logical acquisition. It is not a static acquisition. So in principle, if you do it again, you might get a different answer because some of those files might change. And also, it doesn't get everything. It doesn't get the unallocated space. You can't recover deleted files, but it's perfectly fine. It's evidence from a phone. That's one way to do it. Um, and here's other ways to do it. There's a RIF box that is used to connect directly to the phone and acquire data from the circuit board with a JTAG. JTAGs are these chips. You can also use JTAGs to recover a router when you brick it. I've, had, I've uh, heard about this a lot. If you try to modify the software on a router to add new features, then you can replace the software, but if you mess it up, you can break it so it won't even boot up. And then you can attach one of these JTAG devices to reprogram the memory chips on a router. And the same thing applies to a phone. It is a one way to do it. Um, you solder this, uh, you attach this JTAG, and then you connect to the, with solder, and then you can pull the data right off the chips. Uh, then you can, another thing you can do, if you want a complete, if you want the equivalent for a phone, of a hard disk static image where you're getting every byte off, every bit off the storage device, you do chip off forensics. You take apart the phone, you pull the chips off the motherboard, you put them in a socket, and you read the data off the memory chips one by one. This is something they can do at uh, Drive Savers in Novato. It's of course expensive, you have to work in a clean room, you have to have all kinds of fancy equipment. Here's an example of these. Um, devices you attach them to, chip adapters that you plug the chips into, but you, if you really want to make sure you get every single bit off that phone, chip off forensics is one way to go. Um, I don't know. It would be hard to understand why you would feel you need to do that. I think most people are perfectly happy with like a Celebrite UFED image where you plug in a connector and you get all that you can get that way, but, but this is the way you'd really get everything. All right. Uh, then there's in-system programming is another way to connect to a memory chip and access stored files. Um, all right, there's also emergency download mode on some phones that will uh, intended to let you back up your data. So another way to do it, I know on um, Macs there's something called target disk mode where you can tell your like your i your uh, MacBook Pro that it is to be used as a hard drive. It's another way to connect directly to it as a storage device and make an image. So it sounds like a similar thing. So Androids are typically secured by a pin or with digits or a password or a pattern lock with a gesture or biometrics like a face. And so uh, you might have to overcome these things to get in. Legally, they're quite different. The, um, the Fifth Amendment against incrimination and interpretations of the First Amendment about speech mean that if you have something like um, a password, they are not re you are not required to give that to the police. They demand your password to log in. You are not required to give it to them. But if they need your fingerprint or your face, those are not considered private because anybody can see them um, by just taking a picture of you or looking at you walking on the street. So they can force you to hold your face in front of the phone or force you to put your finger on the fingerprint reader. So people say, if you care about your privacy, use a PIN or a password and not biometrics. So that's a legal issue. All right. And what we're doing, of course, is we're using Android Debug Bridge. Android Debug Bridge is a mode. Well, yeah, it's the way the, way the courts always are with interpretations. You have the laws all the way back, you know, Ten Commandments and everything. You write down this law, and then when cases come up, you read the law and say, what does the law permit and what does it block? 
Uh, what else can you do? Anyway, um, so ADB is the main way you control an Android phone for repairing things and analyzing it, reverse engineering, which is what we're doing. You turn on ADB, then you can connect to the phone through USB, or you can connect to it over a network, through an emulator, and then you can control the operating system of the phone through that port. And if most phones, you only get a limited amount of control, but if you root the phone, you can now get root access on it, and then you can do anything you want. To root it, you typically run a special hack, hacking program. We use Magisk. There are various uh, hacking programs that will exploit flaws and give you root access on the phone. And you call it jailbreaking on iOS devices to get root access on the phone. You call it rooting on Android devices. They're both essentially the same thing. Um, oh yes, I, I see that. That's a, quite a comment. Yes, foreigners, especially Europeans, are generally horrified to find out the lack of privacy in America. It is really extreme. Europe is passing more and more strict privacy laws regulating how things, data is stored on the internet. You have the right to have it erased. You have the right to know what's being done with your data. And in America, you have essentially none of that. For example, it's perfectly legal in America to collect information from your customers and then take that data and sell it to somebody else who will resell it to somebody else who will use it for permission for purposes that you never agreed to. You'll just find a clause in the contract saying, we may share your data with our business partners. And that's what it means. They just resell your data on and on. It's used for all kinds of things you will never know about, and that's legal. And that is totally not legal in Europe. And there's a lot of similar uh, issues. Um, yeah. Yes, that's right. They, so it's, uh, your privacy protections in America are largely coming from Europe. Uh, now, when they passed the, um, the new privacy law in Europe, many American companies had to switch their standards up to that. And Europe is now passing Right now, two new laws I was just talking about in Paul's Security Weekly. There's a new law Europe just passed that took effect like three days ago, or four days ago, that um, says you can no longer force people to tip, uh, install apps only from your Walled Garden app store. You have to let them install it from other sources. Now, that has not fully been litigated and fully taken effect yet, but that would seem to end Apple's policy of forcing you to get everything from their app store. And another one would force people to to close information about their algorithms used to do things like select YouTube videos and uh, TikTok videos. And again, that's in the early stages. But apparently, Europeans are going to have more privacy and uh, you know control of what happens on the internet laws passed. And those will probably slowly pressure American companies to conform to that because they want to do business in Europe. But yeah, and Californians also, yeah, Californians also have the CPAA, which is our version of the European privacy law. Yeah. Anyway, so when you collect the data, uh, there are standard procedures for handling evidence that come from the National Institute of Standards. And so the big issue here is you want to make sure the data is not changed. So first you secure the scene. Um, you, make, you make sure there's no more criminals going, wandering around in the scene and so on, so it's safe to go in there. Then you document it, usually with like a video record, record or uh, photographs. You record everything. And then you collect the evidence. You, and when you collect digital evidence from wireless devices, uh, the best procedure is you get a phone, you connect it to a portable battery pack so it won't die, and then you put it in a paint can or a, a, a bag that can block the radio signals, a Faraday bag, because then nobody can send a remote white message from outside. And then you take it back to the lab to analyze it. Now, when you do put it in a paint can, it's going to start draining a lot of battery because the phone will try to call out to connect to the phone switching station. And when it can't connect, it will turn up the power and send a more powerful signal draining the battery. So that's why you want to connect an external battery. Because if it's already powered up, you don't want it to die or you'll lose all the volatile data. So that's, uh, that's the best way to do it, to transport it back. And of course, you put anti-tamper tape on it or something. Um, Evi uh, tamper evident tape and then you sign your chain of custody form and you say I'm taking custody I'm securing it I went back to the lab made sure nobody had cut the tape therefore I maintain chain of custody right from the crime scene to the lab where it remains under my control so that if when you eventually go to court you can say this is the phone and on this phone we found this evidence all right so I say remove it with Faraday boxes like one shown here they sell you special boxes 
Uh, people use paint cans. People use like six or seven layers of those anti-static bags that you get around electronic components. Anything that blocks the radio signal is sufficient. By the way, remember that you don't have to be perfect. I mean, if you show up at a crime scene and you grab the phone and take it back and you didn't do all that, that doesn't mean it's worthless. It just means there's a possibility that some signals were detected in the meantime. And as we'll say, you often cannot use perfect procedures. Um, so, uh, by the way, some people have talked about using signal jammers. I know there was a lot of talk about this recent, uh, a few years ago. People used to get really mad at people getting cell phone calls in movie theaters. So movie theaters looked into, can we just jam the cell phone? So cell phone calls will not go into there. And it turned out that's illegal. And on top of that, you can get sued because somebody might have uh, like a heart attack and try to call 911 or something. And so then you'd be responsible for that. So uh, these signal jammers, yeah, most people have decided this is a bad idea. You know, BART got in trouble for this. There was a, about eight years ago, there was a big protest downtown and BART there used to be no cell phone service in the BART stations, but BART had recently added antennas so you could get cell phone calls in there. And when there was a huge protest and people started doing stuff they really didn't like, like climbing on the trains and stuff, they turned off those devices so you couldn't make calls to try to make it hard for people to communicate by Twitter and stuff and organize the protest. And they sued, claiming that was illegal. And I think they lost. I'm not sure how that all came out. But, you know, interrupting the cell phone service for any reason is legally fraught and wiretapping it for any reason is legally fraught. There are laws about the phone network that date from way back before the internet and it's very harsh punishments. So anytime you go messing with the phone network you really need a lawyer to help you with what you're doing. It's very easy to trespass on some really bad laws if you do anything to do with the phone network. Anyway, so you got forensic tools like you say Grey's Key will uh, break into bypass pins on iOS devices, although I don't imagine it can do them all. Um, there's something called BitPim and Moblet. Celebrite is the most famous tool. It says Celebrite UFED, you plug it in, it sucks the data off the phone. Considered quite effective and can even break through without the pin if you'll pay for the top devices. All right. Um, and phones don't usually have leftover deleted files anyway. In general, devices using um, the alternative to hard drives that everyone's using now, I can't remember the name of it, the amount of things people are using instead of hard drives, uh, they generally have a garbage collection and erase data immediately so they don't have all these deleted files. You might be able to get some deleted files, but usually you don't get much of anything. All right. And then, of course, you don't need any of that fancy equipment at all. I mean, this is something, if you might find a phone and you don't have the right equipment or it's some weird old phone, you can just take a picture of the screen and then press the buttons to go to the next message and take a picture of the next one. This is, this is evidence. You know, the real evidence in court is the human testifying. You can say, I found the phone. I looked on the phone. I saw this stuff here. It was on the phone. That's evidence. You know, don't have to ha it doesn't have to be done with fancy complicated tools and they have a frame here to just hold a camera and take a picture of the screen and you just poke the buttons to go there of course you're not getting all the evidence you're not finding everything but you're finding something and it was on the phone and if, and as long as you are willing to go to court and say I picked it up off the ground I didn't put that on there it was on there that's evidence so that's the thing to understand all right and so if you do examine a phone you have to have a court order or a search warrant, the consent of the owner, that sort of things, of course. You're not authorized to just take somebody's phone and examine it without their permission or it being an emergency or something. And uh, when you get a warrant, it will specify exactly what device you're allowed to inspect and uh, so on. So the usual stuff. Okay. Well, that's all I wanted to talk about today. And I have some cahoots to review it, so let me bring them up. And then I want to demonstrate something. I want to demonstrate how to hack into password managers, which I think I haven't demonstrated in this class yet. Oh, and now I've gotten now two of the password managers, and they both have the same flaw. So we'll do that after the cahoots. One twenty. One twenty one. Not in my favorites, but I should be able to find it somewhere. Uh, my folders. 
121. All right. We're doing mod 9. There's mod 9. There we go. All right. Yeah, well, you can get a CLI on your phone. I mean, just Android Debug Bridge. We're doing it all the time. I was very happy when I first got the CLI on my iPad. Installed C, started programming stuff. Yeah, Android Debug Bridge. Yep, you turn it on in your phone settings and then you connect with the USB cable and then you can have a, a command shell on your phone. Yeah, we're doing it in the uh, 128 class. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and of course, then you can do a lot of stuff that you can't do through the menus and things. Of course, by the way, if you do that, then that's highly insecure. Then anybody else can connect through that and mess with your phone. So, you know, it's just like uh, custom ROM. You're compromising the security of your phone in order to get control of it yourself. So you don't want other people going in through this mechanism. <laughs> these things yeah it's like someone jumping out on the wire that's that's a fair statement yeah although with the USB there's no encryption or anything to protect you anybody that can plug a USB to the phone now has that command shell too but I think you do have to unlock the phone first so you have that protection for what it's worth So, which one of these is a cell phone? That's called the mobile station, the cell phone. This is the switching center you connect to. The phone itself is the mobile station. The phone and the SIM card together. All right, what's the value that uniquely identifies your handset? That's the IMEI, your unique number. Good. All right, which item issues the encryption key at the mobile switching center? Authentication center. I see I'm missing a letter in there, but that's it. That's what issues the keys. All right. So which partition is the most important to examine on an Android phone? Data is where all the apps and all the data from the apps is stored. That's most of what you want. The rest is pretty much just standard software from Google. All right. All right. That looks like a real name. Okay, good. I know who that is. And that's also a name. Good. All right. So 